In this final session on global sensitivity analysis, we'll be covering linear regression and CART. So both of our regression methods. So instead of just doing a sensitivity analysis, we do a regression and then analyze the sensitivity of the regression model. This was different uh, say compared to the previous two approaches. So again, let's look at the DNAPL case. And so in the DNAPL case, uh, remember we have uh, this case with the infiltration basin. We have uh, parameters involving hydraulic connectivity uncertainty and boundary condition uncertainty. And so what we can simply do is uh, do Monte Carlo that vary all the parameters and then just look at the scatter plot between, for example, the arrival time and uh, the variation of the particular parameter. That is done in this slide. So here we see the arrival time uh, plotted against a certain parameter and the correlation coefficient of that um, particular variable is uh, calculated. So we notice here k-mean gets a very high negative correlation. That makes sense. Increasing k-mean means decreasing arrival time. And as we progress here, we see less and less uh, sensitivity. The problem, of course, is uh, that by this, we're not looking particularly at interactions, that our response is a single variate response. And also that it's very difficult to understand the impact of discrete variables, as it is very mean it's particularly meaningless to calculate the sensitivity on discrete variables. So if we then eliminate that discrete variable, then we can still do uh, what's called linear regression analysis. And so here it's a bit like with the Sobol method, except that our functions are now limited to linear functions. And our functions might may contain parameters or may contain products of parameters. And the idea of this product of parameters is to quantify the degree of interaction by means of this product. Now we have to note that the interaction is a bit more broader concept than a product, but the product is one particular limited way, let's say, of a quantifying interaction. So once we fit that model using least squares, then we can calculate what's called a standardized regression coefficient. It's basically this regression coefficient, but now uh, with a ratio behind it, which is the ratio of the estimated standard deviation of the nth data variable and the estimated standard deviation of the predict uh, prediction uh, variable. So the reason for calculating this here is that we'd like to get these, these, these betas large accounting for this variance. And with beta large means essentially that I will have a higher sensitivity. So that's listed here. And so we see that again, uh, as in the previous case, we have the parameters uh, and their uh, standardized regression coefficients. And we see that k-mean and k-standard deviation come up as uh, large as well as river gradient and the other come up as very small. So you can even go further and apply what is called a student t-test because of course we have limited amount of runs we do and so if you have limited amount of runs we have to worry about um, whether or not these differences are significantly different from zero and so to do that we create this uh, t value which is basically the estimated parameter uh, divided by a standardization of two variances um, the one is the diagonal term of the x transpose x matrix and the other is some kind of estimation variance, uh, but then standardized uh, by the degrees of freedom. So this is your typical T statistics uh, that we use for that. And so what we can then do is, uh, is plot not necessarily the beta values, but also, the, but also look at the actual T statistic. I mean, if the T statistics is large, uh, significantly different from a base rate, then uh, we can say it is influential. And that is essentially in this slide here. So in this slide, we see uh, that the t-statistics without looking at interaction is large for these three and very small for this. We can also look at uh, including interactions. So now we're looking at products. And so we notice now that certain products become important and that the main effects are actually smaller. So in this case, we get a pretty good fit with our linear model. We see here, for example, the correlation coefficient, uh, the regression coefficient is pretty high. Uh, the problem, however, of course, is that here we used a, essentially a case where uh, the model was fixed, the spatial model was fixed. Remember, we have to run flow simulations, groundwater model simulations on a spatial model. In this case, it was just keep constant. Um, for example, only one geostatistical realization was taken. If we now start varying the geostatistical realizations and then repeat the regression, then suddenly we see that our linear model is not at all that accurate. And so again, we have run this problem in global sensitivity analysis in, in finding ways to quantify impact of the spatial uncertainty on the responses. So in summary, 
Uh, linear regression is very well known, very robust, very easy to do. Uh, it can be used in conjunction with experimental design, uh, but of course that would only be very uh, valid if our responses are somewhat smoothly varying, that the linearity assumption uh, must be valid. Of course, that our linear fit is indeed a good fit, um, and that we cannot handle stochasticity uh, or discrete values in parameters, input parameters. So therefore, we need some kind of nonlinear methods or methods that are very different from linear regression. Classification and regression trees uh, are very popular and uh, offer uh, a way forward here in terms of building nonlinear relationships. A regression tree or classification tree, uh, essentially as linear regression try, attempts to do uh, a regression, but it also be used, of course, for classification because classification requires a statement of a discriminant function and uh, determining that discriminant function is a regression problem. Instead of uh, coming, up with, coming up with a very, say, complicated nonlinear model between y and the various x's, the current model does it very differently. It basically says that we can divide up the space of our x variables into pieces. And then we model essentially uh, the y variable as piecewise linear, uh, discontinuous in other words. And that is shown here uh, at the bottom. For example, here uh, we have to say two uh, variables, which is called start and age okay and so this start and age has where some disease is present so they have a present of disease and absence of disease so how would you model that with uh, a regression model well the way the card works is this well let's try to cut up the space into little pieces and then model for each pieces uh, for example the probability simply as the sum or the average of the blue and the green points so we notice in this uh, point here we have our probability uh, of absence is larger, therefore prob probability of uh, presence is smaller. So instead of trying to figure out what is the linear, what is the particular functional form, what we're going to figure out is how we need to cut up this domain into pieces. And so cutting up this domain into pieces would then require to know along which variable should we be doing the cutting up, uh, in which order, and along which threshold should we be doing this cutting up. And so this threshold, once we have this threshold, it also allows us uh, for example, to, to put things in what is called uh, a tree. And that tree is just an organization of how I've cut the domain up into pieces and thereby modeled that nonlinear function in sort of a piecewise continuous fashion. So here is how that then would work more formally. So suppose we have a data set. Uh, we are trying to predict something, y, this is our response of interest, and we have some input parameters x, and we have possible many uh, samples of that. So what we're going to do is, if you have just a two-dimensional domain, so we have a, 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 a domain uh, which has variable x1 and x2, then uh, what we'll try to do is to cut up that domain into pieces. And so the question then is, first of all, along which variable do I do the first cut? And that has to be decided. And if I choose the variable uh, on, along that direction, where do I do uh, sorry, along that variable, where do I make the cut? Do I make it here or do I make it here or there? So that essentially is an, a sort of an optimization problem. We'll see you later. Because what we'll try to do, shown in the next slide, is we try to cut up. Basically, we try to reduce the error of modeling the data. For example, if I don't cut up the whole domain, what I just simply have is a constant variable over the domain. And the estimate is simply the mean of the sample values. So this is basically the mean of the color here. If I cut it up at, some, at a certain point, for example, along this threshold, what I'm then trying to do is calculate the mean over this area, the mean over this area, and see how much a reduction essentially I get into uh, the error between the model and the data. So you could say, yeah, but that's kind of uh, trivial, right? Because then I just cut everything up into a single piece around the data. And this is where we have to do some cross-validation. We have to make sure uh, of course, that we don't cut up everything into pieces such that uh, there's only one data point within each region. So this uh, cutting up and this cost validation and this essentially this optimization problem is, is the technicality that's behind CART, and I, I refer to the literature of doing that. Uh, so we're not going to cover that here. That's just the technicality. Uh, the other way of, of, of viewing this then this problem is to say, in this particular case, we notice that I first cut up uh, the domain along X2 with this threshold T1 and so on, and then I used to have two domains and I cut those domains up and you notice that that domain is cut up along T3 and then uh, T2. So what we have here is we have first the total domain, which you cut into two halves based on this first variable. So that's the first half, this half, uh, 
the left half and the right half. And so the left half is cut up along T2, and the right half is cut up along T3, T and so on. So we can organize all that into a tree. And so at the bottom of this tree, then we get the various regions uh, that are obtained if the cutting up would, would be st stopped at that particular location. So here we see you have the five regions, and this corresponds to these uh, five regions. So this what we see here, the math is, is it looks complicated, but it's actually very simple. The mass is essentially that our, our model is essentially a piecewise uh, continuous. So a discontinuous, we have basically an indicator variable. And that uh, I use as estimator simply the mean of the points in that, in that region. So here's uh, essentially the same. So we have, again, two parameters and one uh, univariate response, uh, which is essentially the color here. And so we notice in this domain that we have areas of constant red, so those will be uh, created uh, with their own uh, cut-up regions, and that most of our variability here is in the middle of the domain. So we're expecting more uh, heterogeneity and heterogeneity in terms of cutting up the domain here. So formally, that's what I what I said uh, in the previous slide about the split quality is, is formulated here. So if you uh, decide to split up here at 5.5 along x1, and that split quality is simply the mean of the, the total values, which is simply the mean uh, value of the sample points. And then we get two new mean values, another new mean value here, and we compare uh, what is the, the reduction in cost that we get by subtracting the left part and the right part. Basically, now we have a, a piecewise mean as compared to a global mean. So we'd like to calculate what is this reduction in uh, least squared error that we get in that sense. And so on. So we can uh, go on like that and we create a new one. And we can do that now. Of course, we can cut it up uh, based on anything. You can cut up based on a discrete variable, functional variable, or a scalar variable. So if we do that and we continue, then this would be the result. As we see here, that indeed in this domain where we have a lot of red, a lot of red, a lot of red, we see that these all go blocked together. And in the domain where we have more variation, then we see that we get uh, much more uh, heterogeneous regions. So what we then do is the model is essentially replacing everything by uh, the mean value. So again, we can then uh, represent all this cutting up with this tree. For example, I cut up first at x is seven and a half. This is the main cut up. Uh, and then I have a left region and a right region, sorry, a left region and a right region, and I keep doing that. Okay. Let's see how this now works with our uh, CART model on this uh, case. So now I can put in discrete variables, such as the type of covariance model. And I can understand now, for example, how arrival time um, can be modeled with CART. Later, we'll see that we also can model this, uh, this functional behavior, and that will be called functional CART. So here's our result. Uh, and so we see here that the, the split is mostly done based on H uh, Rivgrad, that is the uh, the sensitivity related to the, uh, the gradient, then came mean case standard deviation, and so this is, uh, and so on. Uh, so you say, why does this plot come from? Well, that comes essentially from, from the splitting here, and that's what I uh, show in the next slide. So here we see that being, uh, basically, it is a mathematical representation of what we saw in the previous slide. So a parameter is going to be sensitive, of course, if, if you make splits on it, on that parameter, and we see a big relative improvement uh, in terms of the fitting of the model. If there's no relative, if there's not much improvement, it means that parameter is totally not impacting uh, my response. But if we see a big improvement, then I would say there is a, a, a big contribution to uh, the variance there. And so basically what we're doing is that every time we split, we're going to calculate for that variable, what is the improvement we make? And we sum up those various improvements. So uh, that's basically what's written in this equation now. So uh, and that's what you can uh, verify uh, with the previous slide uh, when you look at that uh, particular tree. How do we now do uh, regression trees when our output is functional data? For example, imagine instead of having a domain here with two variables and predicting a scalar, I have now a domain with two variables, and at each location I have a function associated with that. And I'd like to calculate the sensitivity analysis over the entire function. One thing, of course, you could do is calculate the sensitivity at each time step, and that will give you a sensitivity varying time step. But imagine I would like to do this for this object, which is called a function. So 
you notice that if uh, if I split the domain in two, then I have basically I split my functions into into two parts. And then the question now is, uh, how would I calculate the cost function, right? The cost function previously was the mean, so I'd I calculate the mean function, and what's the really the meaning of the mean function? And so instead of doing that, we'll do uh, something uh, different, uh, and actually something that we've seen before uh, is looking at a metric space. So the way it can be done is that once you cut up the domain into two parts, uh, basically you can also calculate the distances between all these functions and plot those functions in multidimensional scaling plot. So basically I look at the functions, I do some kind of uh, distance calculation, plot them in the multidimensional scaling plot. And so if I cut up the domain now in X1, I create two groups. And those two groups essentially are the two groups here in our multidimensional scaling plot. Remember each point, uh, coincides with a, a function, and each function coincides with a set of parameters. So what I can now do is, instead of calculating a mean, I can calculate the midoid here uh, of, of that uh, function. So I look at this uh, particular group and calculate the midoid and see how that uh, differs uh, from when I use the midoid of the entire group. How, how does essentially uh, my, my split quality go down when I use uh, the midoid of the function uh, assign it to each of these points versus the metoid assigned to in the entire point. So that's the same idea of DGSA here. So that means if we have two groups, then uh, we know that important parameters split uh, responses into discrete categories. So it's the same here. That's if, I, if a parameter is important, then that histogram of that parameter in this group will be very different from that histogram in that parameter in that group. And so then hopefully, of course, I also get a reduction in the split cost if that would be an impacting parameter. So this is basically uh, combining these two ideas. Okay, so let's see how that works in reality. So here we have a case study, which is a shale uh, reservoir in uh, Colorado called the Neobrara Shale. And so in this uh, case, we have 178 uh, producing wells with production data, as well as various uh, completion and geological parameters. So um, here we see some examples of production data. So this is, produces both, uh, both gas and oil. And so we see that our production data here is, is quite uh, noisy. So what we would like to understand this is what is really impacting these oil and gas rates? Because there is it's so many, it's in, in shale gas, as we do hydraulic fracturing, there are so many complicating factors. There are factors related to the geological variability, which such as uh, total organic content, pyrite, uh, oil gravity, clay content, et cetera. But also there, um, there are, um, completion parameters, it means how do we actually design the well and try to describe our stages, how many stages we use, what's the length of the well, how much water do we use, et cetera. So we'd like to understand uh, the impact of these various parameters on our, uh, on our production. And that hopefully can then be used to optimize production of future wells. Okay, so the first thing we have to get rid of is the noise in the data. Uh, and so what we do here is a simple spline smoothing. It's also called functional data analysis. So in functional data analysis, what you simply do is, is to write your, your function, uh, your, in this case, oil rate, as a linear combination of fixed basis functions. So this basis function here are spline functions. And so in addition, you want to get some smoothness in that function. So for example, we can have also add to that a smoothing term, which says that uh, my second derivative should be uh, accounted for in terms of the, in the fittings. We don't want to have uh, things going up and down uh, very violently. So after that is done, what we basically have is, uh, next slide, we've taken our, uh, our oil rates uh, and our gas rates, and we've smoothed them all out, and we get nice, beautiful uh, functions uh, with minimizing the loss of uh, information. So because we're dealing with functions, we see later on is that we have to use this metoid idea uh, in clustering, essentially, uh, by the cutoff, grouping the functions into several groups, and thereby calculating metoids instead of uh, means. Okay, so I can uh, go ahead and fit a tree. You can fit uh, either a single variate tree or a multivariate tree. Uh, a multivariate tree means that you're both fitting to the, uh, the shale and assorted uh, gas and the oil rate. And so we notice here that there are some parameters that are, seem to be important, such as uh, number of stages, where you drill the well seems to be important, which fluid you're using to drill the well, etc. So that it goes down the, down the chain. So we can then uh, look at that. For example, I can look at the wells drilled that are uh, that have a certain 
um, completion stimulated length here uh, to the left and to the right. Uh, so these are all the red wells, these are the red wells, and these are all the blue wells, which are the blue wells. And you see indeed that there is an impact here uh, in terms of splitting that up. This is uh, for gas and this is for oil. We can go further down the tree and now look at uh, the black ones versus the blue ones versus the red ones. And again, we see differentiation. So this seems to be coincided with lower production uh, for gas and so on. So as we, of course, split up more, uh, we'll see less and less uh, differentiation. So here we're looking at the blue, the, uh, the red group. So those are seem to be still quite uh, different in gas uh, as well as in oil. And so on. So after a while, of course, we see less. And less. So how do we do multivariate functions? Um, well, because we have oil rate and, and gas rate. So uh, so now we calculate basically two uh, distances, distance based on oil rate and distance based on gas rate. And so again, we take metoids based on, on those joint distances. So the sensitivity analysis is just as before, uh, except that now you're clustering on, on two, um, basically two, uh, two functions, not just one function. And that then will give you the uh, ultimate uh, uh, sensitivity analysis for CARTs. So we can do sensitivity analysis based on Single variate, that means just say gas rate, um, or we can do multivariate where we want to do sensitivity on both gas and oil rate, and they can of course be different. Although in this case, we see that mostly the sensitivities lies in um, in the completion parameters being performed and less sensitivity in the geological parameters being performed. So that means may mean two things. It means either that geology is not important, or probably what's more likely is that the geological parameters being provided here are uh, insufficient to measure the geological variation. And so we need to do a more careful study and in including more realistic geological variation than, for example, a few average parameters over, over wells. So that's it for sensitivity analysis. So what we get is uh, CART is, can be used both for sensitivity analysis and, uh, and regression classification. And it was really nice about CART, it can really be extended to deal with any input or output. So it's quite general that way. The same problem, of course, with spatial uncertainty. We don't look at that here. Um, the other problem occurs when we have discrete variables which have too many outcomes, because basically CART deals with a discrete variable that way by creating so-called dummy variables or indicator variables. And there will be as many indicator variables as there are outcomes for the discrete variable. So for example, if you have a discrete variable with 50 outcomes, Basically, CART consists that, uh, considered as 50 variables, and then the tree becomes uh, too unwieldy to deal with. So typically only five or 10 uh, outcomes are, are a maximum for discrete variables. What you get out of CART is the total effect. So in terms of SOBOL, that means the main plus interactions. Uh, what you don't get is the, just the main effect uh, when you look at these uh, Pareto charts.